the next panel. We're still within the 15 minute uh, margin that was outlined for our on time arrival. If everyone could please sit down, take, put their tray tables up in the full and upright position, get your seat backs in the appropriate, what do they say? And all those people gabbing in the back, you're going to have a bag drop from the ceiling. Please put it on yourself first. So thanks again uh, to all the panelists so far. For me, it's been a treat. Obviously, I'm interested in all of this, but I think the presentations and the panelists have been fantastic so far. Um, I'm really excited about the next group as well. Um, I will again introduce the uh, moderator. Uh, Joseph Ugaritz is the uh, recently uh, promoted new position with Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning at uh, the Honors College here in CUNY. And uh, he's been involved uh, quite a bit in uh, both open source software and uh, OER initiatives uh, starting a e-portfolio project using WordPress, which is now, as I understand, six, eight campuses? Eight campuses are now using where students' uh, work is collected uh, throughout their time uh, on, uh, at school, and then they leave with uh, something that uh, they can uh, show their work, and it's been quite successful. So I'll hand it over to Joe uh, to introduce the panel, and uh, thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Patrick, and thanks to everybody. Thanks for the invitation to be here. It's really great to be here. I want to introduce myself in a little more detail because uh, Ken had the uh, distinction of having the longest title, and I think I've got him beat. My new title is, uh, see if I can even remember it, Professional School Senior Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, parentheses, Teaching and Learning, slash Chief Information Officer. So <laughs> that's got to be the one. <laughs> So we have a, a great panel here, folks, uh, whose work I, I've kind of known and admired, and I'm really uh, anxious to let you uh, get a chance to hear from them. We're not going to do any presentations. We're just going to have each uh, person introduce himself uh, a little bit and talk about his, uh, just the basics of his involvement with, uh, with open uh, initiatives. I really want to frame this a little to say that we've, we've talked about open educational resources and open source software and open initiatives. This panel was labeled learning and the, and the future of learning. And so I kind of want to start by asking how many in the audience today are affiliated with a, with a college, university, or school? Put your hand up. Great. I'd say more than half. And of those, how many consider yourself or identify as, as faculty or academic staff? Probably less than half of that. Um, how many people here have ever learned anything? Okay, so I think we're set for that. So uh, let's just go down the row and uh, have our panelists introduce themselves and then we'll, uh, I have a few questions. They'll have questions and answers for and from each other and we'll look for the same from you too. So go ahead. So uh, my name is Charles Severance. I am a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Information. Um, my sort of reason to be invited was I am the PMC chair of the Sakai open source project. Um, I am a pretty fanatical person about open source, open educational resources, open content. I teach two very popular MOOCs on the Coursera platform, so if you want to sneak into sort of the MOOC questions, I teach a course on Python that's had over uh, mil millions of uh, students and a course on internet history. Um, I also uh, I, I'm the guy with the tattoo. Uh, this is the tattoo that I call the Ring of Compliance <laughs> that has to do with all of the uh, LMS vendors as they would comply to one by one to IMS Learning Tools Interoperability. I promised I would tattoo their logos on my shoulder. Uh, there is a logo for Martin's Moodle on my shoulder. It was um, a big factor. <laughs> I certainly made a lot of fuss as each one was put on. I even had them filmed and would walk into the Blackboard conference and show Michael Chasen with great fanfare his Blackboard logo on my uh, <laughs> shoulder. Um, the work I'm doing right now is uh, trying to build the 
uh, what I consider the first uh, open source implementation of the next generation digital learning environment uh, that I think will be characterized by, instead of learning management systems as the source of all that is true and good in teaching and learning education technology, but instead uh, I would propose that in five to ten years we will have an app store with learning apps in it with 100,000 and we'll be able to plug those into learning management systems as easily as we install apps on our phone. And so that's my current research area. Uh, hello, I'm Martin Dugiamis. Um, how many people here have heard of Moodle? <laughs> Probably. So, uh, yeah, I'm often called uh, Mr. Moodle, but um, actually I have a dog that is a Moodle, and his name is Mr., so that's my dog, <laughs> I usually say. Uh, so I come from basically down there. It's almost the exact opposite place on the earth to this, uh, 12 hours time zones away in Perth, Western Australia. Um, my parents are German and Greek, and uh, I live in an Anglo sort of country with a lot of immigrants in the Asian part of the world. So I've never really thought of myself as anything particular, but always a world citizen. And when I uh, started developing Moodle from the very beginning, it was always uh, a global project, and I was always thinking about um, translations and different cultures. And really, Moodle has, has always been that and continues to be that. Um, the, the education in general is a very diverse space, but when you look at it across the globe, it's very diverse. Um, and uh, I travel to places around the world uh, going to conferences, and I was in, like, in Brazil a few weeks back, and Moodle's like 90% of all the institutions use Moodle in Brazil. Same in Spain, same in a lot of Latin America. And, so um, it's become a very big project, and I sometimes reflect on um, how you make open source work. And for me, it's about building a, a base of um, software for an open source software project, a, a base that people can trust. And you're trying to create the initial conditions for complexity to happen, for, um, for people to want to be involved, to start directing their energy in different ways. And um, across the, the Moodle ecosystem, there are people doing all kinds of things. Um, but the, the point of it all is they're all contributing energy in some ways, and that's what drives the project forward. And so we, we've continued to grow quite steadily from the very beginning back in, well, my early prototypes were back in 1999 um, until today. And it still continues growing. We're still doing very exciting things. And uh, if I could just finish on one thing, probably though my major topic I wanted to talk about today, and it's already come up a lot today, which I'm really glad to see, is about sustainability of open projects. Um, it's all very well to have things started by a grant or by a particular um, initiative, but if you don't build sustainability into the models, then I think um, it's not going to work long term. So that's the main thing we need to talk about and think about. So. Thanks. Uh, I'm George Siemens. I'm with, uh, I'm a professor and executive director of the Link Research Lab at University of Texas at Arlington. And uh, my interest in openness, I guess, probably started in uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when um, it was a, just a very simple experiential encounter with the value of openness. And that encounter was I had an opportunity to uh, share ideas and, interestingly enough, have people I'd never met in person comment on those ideas. At that point, it was a very clunky platform called Blogger that uh, uh, was down more than it was up. I remember <laughs> celebrating New Year's Eve, which probably gives you a sense of how much of a loser I have the capability of being, <laughs> but in 1999, cursing the fact that I couldn't get FTP access from Blogger to my hosted site because uh, Blogger was down. I think there was one person running it at the time, and he was drinking, apparently. Um, <laughs> so my... Um, my experience was really just that. It was, it was the, the simple idea of no cost way to make my, what I thought was my knowledge at least, but a no cost way to make knowledge available. I mean, in the past you had to be able to publish a book. It would cost you hundreds, thousands of dollars to make your knowledge available to others. Whether that was in the form of a book or whether that was in the form of a faculty member teaching in a university or a politician or whatever else. So sharing what you knew was a very expensive endeavor. Um, and even up until a few uh, really decades ago. And then all of a sudden to be able to do it with absolutely zero cost was just a fascinating experience for me. And that very simple experience really has been what's shaped uh, much of my work and thinking since then. Uh, since that time though, what we've realized is initially the utopian wonderful meadows of love and kindness that we were going to experience in this new egalitarian world of equity and fairness and openness 
ended up turning into a bit of a shit show with the <laughs> development of a lot of noise and the development of a lot of hype and marketers and spammers and whatever else in social media, Web 2.0 or whatever else you call it. All of a sudden, companies realize that you can uh, nudge people to certain types of desired behavior and you can mine the activities where people share their innermost secrets about what they had for dinner and that insurance companies will use that data to decide whether or not you're a suitable insurance candidate. Mm. and your physical activity will also be used as part of that. Just yesterday I was reading that Uber will also recognize when your battery is low on your phone and will increase the fare simply because they know you're desperate for a ride and will <laughs> take whatever it gets at you. So now I started to realize, well, this utopian meadow creates an awful lot of data that people that I didn't think cared about it initially suddenly did care about it. And as a result of that, my attention turned to this idea of what does openness mean in this landscape? I was very involved with open education in, starting in, in really uh, late 90s, early 2000. And since then, a lot of the activities I've been involved with have been at least in some level engaged with the idea of making ideas openly available. Today, though, I think the most pressing concern that we face, at least from an educator's perspective, is that the analysis and sorting that's happening on our learners is being done in a fairly closed way and that sorting is being done in such a manner that uh, it can't be validated, it can't be subject to additional research orientation and questioning, and that's an enormous challenge because we're being sorted without being able to understand how that sorting happens. I read an article recently that looked at uh, crime prediction models that are heavily biased to identifying uh, people of color as being candidates simply because the algorithms are biased. And so my interest now is around open learning analytics. We produced a paper about four years ago on this through the Society for Learning Analytics Research calling for vendors and others to start treating the algorithmic underpinning of our society, particularly in reference to learning processes, as something that needed to be transparent and open and understood by researchers. And that's my current interest. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alex Cartwright. I'm uh, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for SUNY. Uh, and I'm also the interim president of our research foundation for SUNY, which is a billion dollar research corporation. Um, I, uh, I want to start by first saying that I'm also a faculty member uh, at the University of Buffalo, where I'm a faculty member in electrical engineering. And I started uh, with some of uh, open uh, courseware materials a long time ago, also late 90s, uh, looking at how could we actually uh, make applets available uh, at the time for explaining photonics uh, because nobody could afford all of the equipment that was needed for photonics. And so could we do something like that and then share it across the entire uh, country and world? Um, and it was, uh, it, it was somewhat uh, interesting and successful, lots of challenges and problems uh, there. And then I got a little bit uh, uh, distracted with uh, uh, some other things, uh, tenure and promotion and uh, making sure that my research uh, had all the publications and everything that it needed to, to have. Um, and so I, I, I put that aside a little, a little bit and then focused on uh, my basic research and then eventually uh, moved into administration, uh, a lot of administration. I still have my research labs, but uh, I'm now running SUNY uh, as the provost. The, the SUNY system, for those of you who don't know, uh, is 64 campuses, uh, uh, 460,000 students, uh, 35,000 faculty. Uh, and how do you, uh, from a system level, think about encouraging uh, certain uh, behaviors, certain practices that you might want to encourage? And how do you engage all of the faculty across uh, that entire group and uh, staff and, and students? Um, and so what we've really been thinking about is three cornerstones of what is SUNY, um, and that is we are interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we will focus on the completion agenda, and I'll, I'll explain why we're interested in that in a little bit, and that we're interested in the impact of the work that we do as an institution. So if you look at those uh, uh, three um, legs, essentially, to the stool, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is about making things accessible about making sure people ha uh, that we have equity in our society and that people have the opportunity to be successful. Um, similarly, our completion agenda is about how do we get uh, the degrees, the certificates, the credential that is needed to actually help people to move forward in their lives. 
how do we reach students where they are academically and physically? Uh, and how do we make it so that they have the opportunity, again, to succeed? And then how do we think about the impact uh, of all of the work of our students, faculty, and staff across all of New York, and what is the impact that we can have on New York? I believe that a lot of this will happen through open resources, open uh, educational resources and otherwise. Um, we are interested in journals. We're interested in um, how do we uh, provide the opportunity for our faculty to participate in this. We're interested in how can we, there was a question earlier about how do you get uh, people out of the mine, uh, it's mine uh, attitude and getting them to share. And that's a great question because it's not an easy one to answer. Uh, and I think we want to be able to set up a mechanism where we can encourage people to participate in this and that there has to be the appropriate rewards and opportunities for people to succeed uh, in there. I'll end there, but I'll have more to say uh, later about how we might be able to do some of those things. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I want to pose a question to the panel, and, and this is maybe asking you to go to a more philosophical level than you were expecting, but I, I think you're up to it. Um, we heard a lot this morning in the, in the keynote about what happens when the content is freely available. And it kind of had me sitting in the back row thinking about how, I mean, I've been a teacher my entire adult life, and communicating content is part of what I do, but it's not the heart of what I do. Um, teaching is not only communicating content, and the role of a university is not only to communicate content, or the role of a platform is not only to facilitate communicating content. So I want to ask the panel, other than communicating content, what's the, what's the role of your project or your institution? And how, how, do, you, how do you see that happening uh, better or well or worse or anything? I'm going to jump in. Please. Um, I think the, the, my interest right now is very much on this idea. I, I think there's two big things that we have to do with our learners today, and that has to drive much of what we're doing. And this is a reflective recent reports that the World Economic Forum released as well that looked at what kinds of skills are going to be needed going forward. And uh, quite honestly, the skills that are needed are not the ones that we're necessarily preparing our students to engage in. There's a number of skills that relate to the ability to work well with others, uh, sometimes termed as soft skills, even though they're actually kind of hard. And uh, the other aspect, uh, so I'd say two things that we need to do with our learners. One, we need to help our learners become better aware of the, that ambiguity is the norm. Like ambiguity isn't something that should be fought or resisted or whatever else. It's just a reality. Uh, all knowledge is basically an if-then statement, and that's really the point of what learning should be as a practice. Uh, the second aspect is helping individuals to begin to think of the world in integrated and complex ways. So I've been involved in a few conversations lately, some that haven't turned out in spectacular fashion, but that emphasize <laughs> the importance of, uh, for me at least, that we need to understand change as a complex process. It's an ecosystem. It's not single variables. The way we've done research in the past of single variable identification of, of relationships is now given way to the idea that it's an ecosystem. So if you want to drive change, don't give me a single answer. Don't tell me that openness is going to change education for better, because it won't. It'll actually just give a few people a job and a lot of stress. Uh, if you really want to make a change, you have to start thinking in integrative and complex ways, recognizing the many facets that are involved in the system, and either hitting all of those facets or beginning to move outside of that system. And so as a result of that, our interest now is heavily focused on social and affective computing and the impact that that has on openness, because I do think we're the last generation that's going to be smarter than our technology, and as a consequence of that, we and every time we die, our knowledge goes away. I mean, our, you know, my kid didn't end up with any of the knowledge that I had, apparently. And fortunately, not a lot of the stupidity either. But <laughs> as a result of that, um, computer doesn't, you know, computationally, we don't have that reset naturally. It just keeps accumulating and growing and growing. And it, it sounds like a simple thing to say, but that's the heart of the issue. You know, our, our, our intelligence is not the future of humanity. It's our beingness. And I think as a result of that, we have to start thinking about the development of those attributes that tap into human nature simply because we're losing to technology cognitively and intellectually. Uh, I, I, would, I would second a lot of uh, uh, what was just said in, in that I, I also think that, you know, the whole concept of how do we uh, teach people to learn and to be critical thinkers. Um, this is a little bit of the soft skills stuff that 
your, your people refer to it as. Um, but I think it's it's beyond that. It's you know it's also how do you uh, in, inquire around what is going on. Um, I do believe not just you know when we talk about openness and and how much material there is out there. Uh, part of the challenge is really going to be how to assess that uh, all of that material. How do you know the quality? How do you know uh, where you should believe what you should not believe? How do you uh, um, throw away the things that you think are wrong? Um, and that is to me the essence of of learning. Um, and that is how to, if, if I can teach a student, um, uh, this is very interesting about the content part, because uh, the content question, it, it, lots of, lots of, a uh, number of people believe that our job is to just uh, transmit the content, uh, but I, I, I've always uh, thought that if I could go into a classroom um, and uh, uh, teach without actually worrying about uh, transmitting content, mm. I'd be much more effective. Uh, and that is, I would, I would work with the students and talk to them about how, how to do things. And that's actually mm. just from my own learning style, because we're all a little different, right? Um, uh, when I, I, I tell my students this when I teach a lecture that's bigger than the number of you in, in this class, in this room, um, and that is that at most lectures that I attended, I was in the back row and I knew everything about the ceiling. Um, <laughs> because they didn't pay attention. Um, because a lot of it was talking to me. Um, but the lectures where I paid attention and uh, really got into the material was if someone was going over uh, problem solving or if someone was talking about how they made decisions in a design. Um, why did you choose that? Why did you, what are the, uh, what are, what's the criteria that you used? Um, those were much more fascinating because I think they really get at what it is to learn because a lot of the stuff we can look up we can see it. So I think, again, it's this idea of going well beyond content and thinking about how do we use what content's available. That makes people uncomfortable because much of our premise in education has been around textbooks and other things as the ultimate uh, academic um, uh, activity. Um, and I think that what we're finding uh, is that, in fact, uh, that's going to be there, as you said. It's going to be available. And why are we, what, what's going to be the new textbooks? Well. It's going to be about different things. We're going to be teaching how to use that material. And I think that's really where, where all the learning is going to go. Good. Uh, from, uh, so from my perspective, um, when I started Moodle, I was thinking uh, about, uh, I was helping a lot of academics use the internet, running into walls and thinking that we can have a solution here. And as a young, naive computer scientist, I started getting into education, started doing a lot of research, and I started writing software. I started trialling it out, doing prototypes on particular courses, and I was studying those courses, but I was taking feedback in an action research process. It was very tight. I was literally modifying the software we were using for the mm. course every day. And I had in my mind this notion that somehow if I kept doing that, if we worked this way, that the software itself would encode the philosophy, um, the, the pedagogy, or that would bring quality teaching online. So the content in my case is more the software here. Mm -hmm. I've learned that's not the case at all. Um, <laughs> so when people take a complex piece of software, um, they do not use it how you expect to. They, of course, have their own preconceived notions, their own um, knowledge that they're building on, and they use it how they, used, how they know um, teaching should happen or how they think it should happen. Um, and as a result, I would say the quality of online uh, education using the, the tools of today is generally pretty bad mm -hmm. because the people who are doing it have not themselves gone through online learning, at least never good, really mm -hmm. successful, engaging, exciting, thrilling online learning as it can be when taught by a really good facilitator who knows what they're doing and how to use the tools and how to create this real engagement. And what they tend to do is fall back on the default position of dumping textbooks at students and then quizzing them on it. So um, what I've learned is that um, the software is still a very small part of the total scenario. And as we've moved through this project, my interests are more and more on the education of the educators, on getting engaged in things like policy uh, at different levels, at institutional levels, at governmental levels. Um, 
uh, our educators are so bogged down with simple administration. Hmm. You know, so much reporting, so much stuff that's trying to do the right thing, but actually just making the problem worse in many cases, uh, at least you know, in many countries. So, yeah, I, I guess uh, as I've got older, my interests are getting more into those areas, and it's really much more about humans than it is about technology. Yeah. So I'll, I'll answer from the point of view of an open source learning management system. Good. You heard Martin say that learning management systems are not all that sexy. But at the same time, learning management systems um, provide a, a base spot for teachers and students to come together. And it's a, it's a starting point for, for their teaching and learning. And the features that ended up in all these systems are the common features that you tend to find. And they, the things that get used, there's about four or five of the features that tend to get used a lot. Quizzing, discussion, resources, et cetera. And these, Great book. Um, and so IT organizations want something that does at least these five things, and commercial vendors are quite happy to uh, whip up a quick and dirty piece of software that meets those five things barely. And that turns out to satisfy 80% of what's needed in education. The problem is, is the 20% needs, to, is A, the interesting stuff, and B, needs to grow. So I think of a learning management system's job as to get to the point where the basic needs are satisfied, to the point where the teacher craves something else, right? And, and here's the fundamental difference between an open source learning management system and a closed source commercial vendor. The moment we get to the point where we think we've met those basic needs, we actually continue to listen to faculty. We're super curious. And I know I've seen you in many, many deep conversations, and we have them at Sakai meetings, they happen at Moodle meetings, with faculty or tech support people or proxies for faculty, and they say, you know what? Your stuff's not quite right, and it needs to do this. And we go like, oh, wow, that's a good idea. Hadn't thought of that. Let me go back and try to make all that work doesn't happen with the commercial vendors. They listen to the IT folks that say, well, it needs to be in the cloud, and it needs to do this, it needs to have a nine, five nines of uptime, and whatever. And so, so understand that open source learning management systems, the customers are the teachers, and the goal of a learning management system, like Moodle or Sakai, is to get you to the point where you've done what you can with that, and you think, wait a sec, is there more? And I'll riff again on something Martin said, and that is, I want to get to the point where educators think of themselves as educational software makers. Martin, when you first started, you were a maker. You were making it, you were living it, you were changing it. And I think if we go to the next generation digital learning environment to the point where everybody owns their own widget, and so I will have my, my current classes, I write 10 to 20 widgets per class that are game-like things or interactive assignments that are not quizzes. Now, I'm weird. I got a PhD in computer science. I'm a committer on open source learning management system. I got servers that, that I do. So I'm, I'm a little weird. But I think in the future, weird is the way it should be. And everyone should feel empowered to expand the system. And so I think that's the important thing that open source learning management systems bring to the party. And that is they don't quit thinking or innovating when they've got the basic five features working. We want to keep innovating. And we want to make it so that the LMS is not the end of the educational technology, but merely the beginning of the educational technology. So we've got weird, the last generation that will be smarter than our technology. I and, disagree with that. And weird is the future. I saw you make a, a head motion yeah. when George said that. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. No, it'd be, this last one would be smarter than George, but I mean, <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I'll, every time anyone makes a statement like that, I say, change the Wi-Fi password on your router and see how long it takes to you print again. Yeah. And so if artificial <laughs> intelligence was so smart, then it could figure out how your Wi-Fi router could print again. And so every time everyone says that, that's my example. Yeah, but I would in turn say that's a typical example of route learning and low-level knowledge. We're looking at the ability for machine learning models to be able to identify the prevalence of cancerous tissue in mammograms at a rate that is more accurate than what a human being can do, and it can do it 24 hours a day. So if your primary view of knowledge is does it know your router password, then um, I'm not sure what to say, but I do think that a lot of these areas where I'm we're right. looking at knowledge work and where we're looking at how traders are happening and the number of traders that are being laid off from financial firms due to automation, the uh, organization of companies such as, uh, well, formerly Google and Uber and others that have left to create a new uh, trucking company to do wireless trucking, you're looking at three to six million jobs that'll be limited in the U.S. alone. So. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, other than just we having an argument. For, we can go for several yeah. hours on this. Well, we do need quite a lot of people writing machine language software, so. Uh, <laughs> well, and that's why it's one of the. It'll get written, too. Yeah. Roomba will write that. <laughs> we, we've got to. We, we could go on on that. Okay. Uh, I, I was seeing a science fiction uh, story where my TV remote could actually find what I want to watch when I want to watch it, but we're not there yet. But maybe we're the last generation that will have to suffer that problem. Um, I did want to push a little bit, uh, I guess, on, on sort of what, uh, what Chuck was saying here. The New York Times this morning had a, a story about uh, the move to stop using the term accident for, for car accidents, instead just call them car crashes, uh, because language is important. And an accident sounds like something that just happened, when in fact most accidents happen because of user error. So, so I'm sort of going a long way around here to look at a, another term, which is learning management system. Um, and Michael and I have, have talked about this before. And I guess this sort of picks up on Chuck's idea that the LMS, learning management system, does the part that's not really learning. It's more managing than learning. But your idea is that, that we go further. I don't know if anybody wants to, to pick up on that a little bit. Uh, I'll just yeah, say, Martin. Martin, what's the first letter of Moodle stand for? Modular. Exactly. Ah, good. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yeah, it, it's really it's it's really a, a plat I usually say learning platform. I don't mm -hmm. I don't really use LMS. Um, I don't use VLE. Uh, mm -hmm. I did start off using course management system in the very beginning, but um, no, it's learning platform is what we say. And we have 1,100 and something plugins written by the community, um, and you can. Uh, build Moodle up with lots of extra plugins or you can tear it down to almost nothing at all. Uh, and so it fits itself into all kinds of niches. But the, to your point, um, I, I think you need, if we're going to have institutions, right, a lot of you are from institutions, you probably like being at institutions. Um, you, for, this, for this period of history at least, I think we're still going to be having institutions, schools, universities, colleges, yeah. workplaces, etc. And a lot of those need a private space, like we have rooms, you know, you need a place for that institution to get together. Um, it's a long way off, probably, that we're all getting together on the same .com site to do all our learning, everybody, worldwide. I don't see that happening. So, for the time being, Yes, an LMS or a learning platform is a place where learning does happen because you do need private places for people to explore, um, socialise, uh, share data safely without worrying about the copyright laws which, you know, are not very open, right? Um, there's still a lot of that around, still a lot of people worrying about the status of data. So, um, yeah, for the time being, yes, I do think learning is, is that is where learning happens. Uh, George, I saw you furiously Googling something while uh, Martin was oh, talking. Oh, no, I was actually tweeting that we just got confirmation of acceptance at our open education conference in fall, so I just wanted to share. Oh, well, thank you guys. very much. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, Alex, you and I come from kind of similarly large and therefore bureaucratic uh, institutions. Do you want to pick up on, on what Martin was saying about this? I saw you nodding. Um, I really don't have much to add. Okay. I mean, it's uh, on that one. Um, uh, the uh, the platforms are. Uh, I do worry that you know we, we have all of these material, all of this stuff out there, that um, um, somehow uh, uh, students uh, believe uh, will will solve, or at least students and faculty and others believe will, will solve all of their problems and make it easy for them to actually learn. Um, and that isn't the case. Uh, it's not the case at all. In fact. Uh, um, in fact, what, what we see in, in, in some cases is that uh, for particular students, um, it, it, it creates an issue where they think that they could not attend class and not interact with the faculty mm. uh, and still have all of the material. Um, and that's a challenge for us, right? Is that this is just, uh, it's like anything we do, it is an additional resource that is there to help uh, with the whole process. And I think that's what is is critical about it. I do agree that it's not a, a, 
learning uh, system, at least not the ones we're using right, right now. Um, but I think it, you know, eventually it could get there with some of the things that uh, people are doing. There's a lot of work happening in that area, uh, and I think it could help, it'll make it better. Much of it is just the management of the classes and, uh, and making sure the content's there. But you see, I think if, if, if those offline things that you mentioned are important in your institution, yeah. then you need to make that part of the curriculum. You need mm. to make that, um, you know, show that's part of it. Well, and I agree. So you would, you would mention that in your learning management yeah. system, right? You have yeah. to be here on Friday, otherwise you're going to lose yes. 5% or something. So oh, I, I agree totally right. with that. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we need to work on, right? Is that, uh, but but I think there's an uh, there's, and I think it's just it's just the period of time where we are that uh, it's adapting of any type of new technology. I mean, these are still relatively new technologies, and over time, people will start to understand how you can most effectively use it. Um, but initially, there is that feeling that you know uh, uh, they can just watch the videos, right? My I have two kids in college right now. Uh, and one of them does uh, think that, you know, because it is available on the uh, LMS and because it, he, he can just watch the lecture, that's what he should do, uh, and not go to class. And, you know, as a professor who actually lectures and really would like to see the students come to class, that's a little concerning for me. Um, and so I, I, I think there's a lot we can do there. I anticipate it'll get better. Um, it is, these people are doing terrific work. So, uh, um, Clearly, it'll 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 get there eventually and be a much better system. But I agree that if you could have a system where all the inputs coming in from multiple users and the users are driving what's the con how it does systems work, that is a way that we could really improve very rapidly. Hmm. Do you want to? No. All right. So let me ask you. Uh, I'm intrigued by this sort of app ecosystem for learning. Um, and maybe I can ask you, since one of the subtitles for this panel was the future, can we imagine in more detail what that would be like? You know, what, what does that look like for me as a student? Does it combine some of these analytics, personal learning analytics? Um, I'm, again, I teach science fiction, so I, I, I'm kind of... Uh, perfect for this. Perfect for this, yeah. Um, I'm thinking very much about Neil Stevenson's book, The Diamond Age. Uh, which you should all read, the young ladies illustrated primer. I'm, I'm forgetting details, but anyway, um, you know, if, if I had a, a, a small pad that was going to be my perfect learning environment, um, what would it do? You know, would it take me to a room with other people in it, or what? Any thoughts? Well, Chuck's obviously thought about this a lot more from the ecosystem perspective, but I'd like to address one component which I think is quite relevant regardless of whether it's a traditional LMS or something, and I do think it'll be a more integrated or, or uh, multifaceted modular system where you have uh, you know, individualized uh, functionality that's augmented, just as Chuck mentioned, the click of a button. But I think one aspect, and uh, we've been uh, working on this together with Columbia University and University of Edinburgh, is on the development of a personal learning graph, which is sort of a multifaceted representation of what a learner knows. We're looking at it from four elements. What do they know cognitively? Mm -hmm. What's their process and their strategy selection for learning? Uh, what are their affective and emotional attributes that define their learning? And then finally, their social interaction. And maybe it's this idea of, you know, the Jesuit tradition as well, that you don't educate just the mind, but you got to hit the heart and you got to hit the body as well. And so I think from that, and regardless of whether it's going to be an existing LMS or we're going to move uh, to a more robust app ecosystem, at some point we still have to start looking at, do we understand our learner? Does mm -hmm. do the software that we're developing, does it understand the learner? And I haven't seen it done well mm -hmm. by anyone. Uh, I've heard a few that played around with it a little bit, and um, so it was about uh, about three weeks ago I had a meeting with uh, with Bill Gates, and so we spent time looking at what's happening with education, what's happening with learning analytics, and during the discussion, one of the questions, and I was talking about the personal learning graph, and he's like, well, you show me anybody who's done a learning graph, and I'm like, I don't know, nobody's done a learning graph, and but, I mean, that was his focus, he says, I've heard learning graphs, and this idea talked about for over a decade, and it's not happening, and yet it's one of those areas that if we ever manage to get it right, uh, it'll have a huge impact because it'll change how the university relates to a student. It'll change how we function and create our curriculum so that rather than giving everybody the same course, we compute curriculum in real time for an individual student based on what we know about their profile. And how that's shared across the system starts to become quite central because apps should write to it, LMS should write to it, the university. Mm -hmm. Curriculum should write to it. And hopefully, I mean, this is really one of the issues around uh, our robotic future. It's that uh, we're meeting AI halfway with our school system. 
because we, we're mechanizing everything. We're, we're teaching and lecturing, and then we're doing simple level testing. It's the, the Annenberg Media Private Universe uh, report from probably two decades ago where they met students at Harvard that had graduated, and they asked them, why do we have seasons? And uh, 21 out of 23 got it wrong. Top oh. university in the world, top graduates, just got their bachelors, and they don't know why the hell we have seasons. And the reason is, we didn't teach them. They didn't develop knowledge. They developed skills to jump through hoops that we've defined, because they can smell that really well. And so that's one of the challenges, is creating a, a technological system, LMS, app system, whatever you want to call it, that respects the human process of learning, agency, and those multiple dimensions that I mentioned earlier, because that's how we're eventually going to be able to properly teach, rather than creating a mechanical system that we have now. So, so. I characterized earlier the LMS's purpose is to get to the point where you know what the next problem is. And then when you get that done, then you get to that gets you to the point where you know what the next problem is and then you know what the next problem is. And our job is to kind of just not stop, right? Not to pretend that we've got this perfect product, buy it off the shelf, but that's where open and involved people working together can build the best possible product. So uh, when, when we were building LTI, um, I, I used the metaphor that uh, when someone presses the lever on the toilet, they just want it to flush. <laughs> and they don't really care about the details, and part of our engineer, we engineer's job is to make that work. And so that's pretty good. And so with LTI, we've got like at least 400 toilets that are properly flushing. <laughs> um, but then there's the next metaphor of if we can get all these widgets out here, and I claim we'll have 100,000 of these things in 10 years, uh, where's all the data going, right? And so the, my metaphor that I'm using for the data is the sewer system, right? Mm. And so if you have a toilet that flushes, but it has nowhere to go, then you're in as bad a shape as if the toilet didn't flush in the first place. And so you think of all these things coming down, and all this stuff has to come back together. George and I might disagree why we're assembling all this data, but there's no question we have to assemble all this data from all these disparate sources. And it might be to show dashboards to humans, teachers that figure it out, or run robots that figure it out. We, we can argue about that. that. That's not the argument. There's no argument on the need to gather the data in a completely standard format and have that data available to everybody. And then once you've got the sewer system working, now you have to worry about the ownership of the data. So you, 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 you just keep hitting a new problem. It's like, oh wow, there is all this data about me from every learning thing that I've done. How much of it is mine? How much of it belongs to my teacher? And how much of it belongs to the institution? And how much belongs to the government? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see this ecosystem as a series of challenges that once we meet that challenge, it just reveals the next challenge over and over again. So can I ask, ask a quick question of Chuck, though? I, I'm just curious, I mean, why aren't we getting there? Like, I do agree. It's this oh. idea of the adjacent possible. Like, we, you know, each, yep. each evolution reveals a new complexity that we need to absorb and, and develop. But I'm curious to see. I mean, we, we recognize that's an issue. We recognize that student ownership, university system, why has there been virtually zero progress with it? It might be a better bar conversation than a conversation that's being recorded and streamed around the world. But I'll say it anyways. I think the investments in learning analytics are going in the wrong direction. There's a lot of investments going into what I'm going to call learning analytics in the small, where we pay one teacher to stare at their own data with 12 grad students for two years, and they write one graph of how their course is a little better, and we give them a ton of money to do that, and we build an open source effort to build a really good learning analytics system, and it gets you know $40,000, and then that's that, and we decide that that's not a problem. So when next you talk to Bill Gates, <laughs> Why don't we get some money to build decent open source learning analytics things so that instead of just buying a black box from a company, we can actually together reach that next thing. So for me, it's just a really amazingly large amount of wasted money in analytics in the software that's not being written the right way. I, I, I want to disagree with both of you because uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't really think, that, uh, just because I'm in the middle, I just mean I agree. I, I don't think this, the ultimate evolution of this is to build the super giant AI that's going to teach us all. I agree. You agree with me. Um, I, and I don't want to see that. What the hell are we going to do? Seven billion people are just going to sit around and listen to the machine. That's... <laughs> Uh, I, I, I also read a lot of science fiction, and I like the futures where we have um, people talking to people and they're a bit more empowered. So at least we reduce a lot of the inefficiencies. I, you're a very well-respected uh, researcher with a lot of skills. It would be a, such a shame if you couldn't teach students and pass that on, George, right? So uh, I think um, 
you got onto analytics there as well. I think what the machines should be doing is um, collecting what information they have, supplying that to the teacher for sure. So computer-aided teaching, right? Computer-aided learning. So you have the information to do your job really well. If I was teaching a class this size, what is it here? 200, 300 people? Mm -hmm. too, um, too many. I can't possibly know your, your backgrounds enough, right? I, I don't know um, what's happening in your life at home. I don't know what other subjects you have. I don't know how old you are, what other degrees you have, or all that sort of background. And if I was teaching a particular subject, as a good teacher, like an old-fashioned teacher who used to stand up in front of a class, they know their students really well. And they're able to suggest extra work. They're able to help a student who needs a bit more help. So I think online, I'm, I guess my interest is more about keeping that going, except doing it better, doing it more in a more modern way, using devices. I mean, these screens are already starting to look antiquated. Probably in a few years, we won't have screens. But maybe it's something in our ear saying, hey, you know, uh, uh, you know, Sarah's having a bit of a problem. You know, get in touch. Uh, or, yeah. We are. I just right. Sure, well, perhaps. Or, you know, or like Johnny's uh, doing really well, you know, give him a thumbs up. So, you know, that kind of support of teaching, I guess, for me, that feels like a more human future. And that's the sort of one I'll be working on. As much as um, I love I, AI. Oh, I see we're getting lines at the microphones, or at least oh. one small line at the microphone. So maybe we can continue to pick up on, on these points, but let's uh, take some questions from the audience, too. Um, we'll start on the le my left. All right, so um, first of all, for you science fiction types, there's a, a great short science fiction story by the little known but genius Henry Kuttner called The Fun They Had about yeah. a girl finding out that education in the past wasn't all about these teaching machines, but everybody in a classroom talking to each other. So look that up when you get a chance. Um, in terms of, uh, there was a comment about why aren't we getting past the kind of student ability to, to own their own data, right? Somebody made a comment along those lines. And, and it's an interesting tension, right? Like I said previously, RIT decided to <clears throat> give them the rights to their work if it was homework or even if they were working on a side project in our labs, God forbid, you know, and when it used to be, if you even logged in to use their internet connection, right, they, they owned your stuff, right? But there's this really tough dynamic that we haven't figured out because on the one hand, we're trying to be an entrepreneurial university that lets guys do this, right? On the flip side, we're also trying to grow into being a research university. Right? which means that we are tired of being tuition driven and we want those gigantic cash cows of patent and licensing to come sustain the institution. I like that face, sir. So, you know, it's, it's a tough walk and I think that so many universities have been traditional R1 universities their whole lives and done quite well at it, that it's hard to walk away and there aren't enough examples like ours that let them do that, right? On the other hand, you have to look at how long those models last. Coming from the land of Kodak and Xerox and Bausch and Loam, who thought that low margins on celluloid, et cetera, were going to last forever. So it's, it's a dynamic that really needs to be discussed. How do you evolve to the point? You know, and as, as Whitehurst said this morning, right, it's all about <clears throat> where's your value add and where your revenue streams and, and how can you figure it out? It's, it's tough. It's tough, and I'm open to that discussion anytime. So I'll, I'll just jump in and beat the open drum a little more. Um, this is where it's really dangerous for a university CIO to entertain a com commercial company that's good at analytics and says, I got a black box thing that'll tell you red, green, or yellow about every single student on the planet and how much money you can make from them, and it only costs $14 million. And if you send me all this data, I'll send you back red, green, yellow dots for every student and we have no idea what's going on in there. We can't look at anything. We can't see anything. We can't actually realize that, wait, that's just all crap. They're, they picked a random number. They rolled a dice and they're sending it back to us. And this is why in this emergent time, 
we must be able to look at and introspect the data, even to ask questions about who should own what data. And maybe not every, we don't start with everybody seeing everybody's data, but at least if there's like a human person on our campus that's looking at the data, then maybe we can trust that human to notice something and tell us about it. And so it doesn't mean that everyone has to see everything, but if someone can see everything, then we have a chance of understanding what this new world that we're, we're stepping into is going to be like. Uh, I'll, I'll, um, so I'm, we're SUNY, uh, 64 campuses, and one of the things that I see that's a real benefit of that is uh, we use this term systemness. Uh, and, and in that model, what we're talking about is how do we use all of the data from across all of our campuses, right? 460,000 students uh, that we could uh, collect data in the, in the right way. And so we announced an initiative uh, at the Chancellor's uh, um, State of the University uh, address in January uh, and talking about predictive analytics transforming higher education, SUNY PATH. And what we're interested in is looking at all of the questions we were just talking about. Which data, who owns the data, where should it be, how do we use it, uh, and how do we then uh, connect with the companies that are interested in developing algorithms uh, to help us around those, uh, that, that data set. So uh, and, uh, I think that's one thing that we need to be doing much more of, because I am, you, know, you do worry that if the, the green yellow dots that you're talking about, what they really mean uh, and how we, how we use them is a real concern. Um, and the student data and, and development of material um, that is developed by uh, students, again, that's a SUNY, uh, it's, it's we're looking at that across the entire system and thinking about who owns that. Uh, and, 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 and to encourage entrepreneurship, we're doing uh, very similar uh, uh, things and headed in the same direction that RIT is, and that is that the students. Uh, well. Thanks, let's uh, go to this side now. I actually have a question for, well, we'll just wander down the way. Um, basically, Chuck and Martin, you're of the opinion that commercial enterprise in the world of software might be fossil as far as its worthwhile endeavor in, in being involved in the learning platform process? Chuck? <laughs> uh, well, no. So th this gets back to my sustainability question, I guess. Um, there's a place for everything. Um, and um, essentially, uh, there's something I often say around the office and I get laughed at, which is, you know, bits should be free, but people should never be, be, should never be free. Um, which, by which I mean not we should, we should be slaves, but that... People's time is valuable. And so any time you've got somebody doing um, valued, skilled work of any kind for someone else, they should be compensated for that. You know, we all have families, we all have to live. So it, I, as we came up before, but I think the old model that, you know, you produce a thing and then you mass produce that thing and you get a little payback for every copy of that thing, that, that model doesn't work anymore. Um, but the model of, if you can find models where people's time is paid, but you always give the bits for free, that's a good thing. And so there's lots of commercial transactions that it can occur in there. Um, and there are lots of different models. And so our primary business model is we have commercial Moodle partners who do services when people ask for them, um, and uh, they get paid for that. And we take a royalty of that, and we 10% royalty from those companies, 82 companies worldwide. And we use that to pay software developers at the core of the project. And we have other revenue streams as well um, that you would say are commercial. So, you know, we have some simple hosting that we do on Moodle Cloud, and that fills a need for people who need that. Um, some people want custom versions of our app with their own branding on it, so that's a little service we're offering. Um, the, uh, um, th there are lots of other little things here and there that all contribute but they all drive the mission of the open project, which is to have this GPL licensed software that everybody can use, and it drives the ecosystem. So yeah, I, I, there's no black and white in there. It's, I think there, there's a place for everything. So I totally agree with Martin. You say fossil like it's a pejorative, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jim this morning talked about the difference between the Linux kernel and Red Hat. He talked about the fact that they will commit to maintaining a kernel for 13 years. There is no way that an open source community is going to commit to maintaining a kernel for 13 years, right? We just say, 
Let's do the last two versions. Oh, that's even painful. So let's do the last two versions and only the last version for if it's more. But and so, and so the the problem is is it's not bad to be a fossil. And from the point of view of running an open source learning management process, project, we really don't need every single university to just send five people to every single one of our meetings. What we need is a representative sample of the bold leadership universities who are willing to act as proxies for the people who are perfectly satisfied with the fossil solution. So the fact that Sakai is a five or six percent market share, that doesn't bother me a bit. And the fact that Sakai doesn't have a 20,000 person conference, that doesn't bother me a bit. Because the people who are there are the people who are bold and willing to think and willing to push things forward. And so fossil code is perfect for 85% of the people in the world, and that's just fine. But some people have to be bold enough to think ahead so that those other people five years later get the right thing. All right, one other question, which is towards George. Um, George, based on the fact that eventually there's not going to be any need for, uh, I mean, as these systems develop and AI comes online, there's not going to be any need for Sakai or Moodle. How long do these guys get to fool around <laughs> um, and play the, the continue to develop yeah, models? You know, Six I'm, I'm at the point where, like, like we've He's got a series around. of Trump reporters going on here because <laughs> I didn't say I didn't say any of those things. <laughs> like I didn't say that we wouldn't have teachers. I didn't say that we wouldn't have an LMS system. I didn't say that we wouldn't learn. What I did say is that com computationally, humanity is at an interesting crossroads where our ability to be intelligent is no longer the most important thing. Our ability to be human is more important because, quite simply, we cannot outthink and outprocess computers. That was precisely what I said, and the recordings will stand. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. This is my response. So, all right. So then, what is the role of us? Can you kind of give me more of a picture around the silhouette of us being human as the most important element of our? Well, there's so many factors at play, and this really, in some ways, is a return to traditional humanity. So let's That's say right. we do agree with World Economic Forum reports and OECD reports and World Bank reports that uh, we're entering a stage where we could potentially see anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of jobs that we now have today, even knowledge jobs, being automated through technology. And let's say that happens within the time window, they say, of five to ten years. Then we end up with an interesting challenge where we have to start to look, and this is why the idea of basic minimum income is picking up interest in certainly Scandinavian countries. But the question we face then is what does it mean to be human in a digital age? What do we do for work? How do we play? When I'm feeling a little more optimistic and not a cantankerous bastard, then I say, you know what? <laughs> Maybe we're entering a new age of art and culture and music. Like, think of it for a bit. A job is a 200-year-old invention in many cases that coincided with the rise of the Industrial Revolution. We've done just fine for most of human history without having a job. Now, going forward, obviously, because of urbanization and, and other trends, we obviously uh, will still have that as an important part because you, for example, if Venezuela goes to shit, which it is, it's going to be catastrophic. And the reason it'll be catastrophic is in the past, when societies collapsed, people could tend their farms. You now have cities of millions of people who can't farm. There is no way out for them except starvation. And so when I think of it from that perspective, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that that return to fundamental human attributes, such as what we've done for most of human history, history you know, make stuff, uh, care for one another, uh, do art. I mean, those are the kinds of things I could see us returning to, but we, we are so mired in work and in the idea of a job that we're literally incapable of thinking what it means to be human outside of that job, and yet it's a 200-year-old invention. Thanks. There's a lot of science Thank you. to do yet as no, well. That was good. Let's go, let's go over here. Uh, so I see a problem in about two years' time if uh, Chuck's idea of the future is, uh, in the short term, <laughs> is a large number of apps uh, that implies that you're going to have a large number of discriminatory algorithms potentially in these apps because they're not going to be tested. So, uh, and that will be the same uh, for Moodle because it's also going along that analytic trend. So I was wondering, what can we do, uh, Moodle, Sakai, whoever, to push back on this? Oh. Well, hmm. well, no, I, I think with feedback, these problems go away, right? You build feedback loops all the time. So 
Um, if a student feedback? starts thinking that a teacher is treating them wrongly, well, they give that feedback very easily. There's like a little smiley face and a sad face at every stage through the process. And so the teacher gets that feedback, it's part of the algorithm, and it's self-correcting, right? So that's, for me, the approach. Yeah, when, when I say apps, I don't mean AI apps that are doing analysis. I mean like a flashcard, right, mm. that says, you know, 3 plus 3, and, and then you got that one wrong, and 2 plus 2, you got that one right. And the analytics is just right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, and that's going off to some other thing. And I'm not talking about 100,000 different apps that are analyzing data. I'm talking only about 100,000 apps that are, that are producing data. And that, it's a separate, a very difficult problem to, to analyze that data, but I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about apps where teachers are encoding their own, what they might do in a room with a student and say, well, try this, try that. I mean, I might have a, a flashcard thing that I make to be slightly adaptive or something, or a chemistry, a chemistry periodic table that's practice, or what I do is write little uh, SQL challenge applications where you're given an SQL challenge and you have to type in the SQL and and it gives you more, it's like SQL uh, mm -hmm. roulette, right, where you have to do this. And so that's the kind of things I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of thousands of little things where the teaching that I might do if you're sitting in my office and I say, here, try this little SQL query. Can you make that work? Try this SQL query. Can you make that work? Could I come up with a way to get that in a widget that is the S SQL practice query? But so that's not about the data. So to quote uh, someone on the uh, panel, I disagree with both of you. <laughs> Uh, so I would say if you look to the amount of code that has algorithms in it, in two years' time, there'd be a lot more of it. So I think there's a lot more opportunity for discrimination. So I'm thinking along the lines of some kind of uh, discussion about that in the middle, you know, in the next two years uh, between the different software communities. Don't you think humans have adequately demonstrated their capacity for discrimination already? <laughs> yes, um, but this but makes it more efficient. Yeah. Mm. Again, so I, I, I just know. I just go back to the notion that openness of algorithms, openness of data, openness of looking at the data and the conclusions the algorithms reach give us some hope that maybe someone will notice something, right, and question it or run it again with a different algorithm and say, wait a sec, this algorithm does this. Or And so, and so I, th that's where I'm just so frightened, especially in data analytics of black boxes, right, because yeah. we yeah. trust them Thank so you. much. and. CIOs pay so much money for them and then they have to trust them because they paid so much money for them. And that's the thing that worries me that, that we're coming up with non-open solutions to this. Any non-open educational analytics solution should be outlawed if I were president. So, okay. well, see, in, in your, I mean, that's the thing. Let's say that a company like Newton, and I'm happy naming them, I mean, they make big claims and yet researchers don't have the ability to validate those Bingo. claims. Like you're breaking from a history of the scientific method with the next generation of analytics tool sets. It's very upsetting. So and I wanna just, I, I'm gonna go to the next question in just a second, but I wanna throw in that those apps sound, those flashcard type apps sound much easier and less challenging to design and build yes. for sort of math and science type subjects, it's much harder to design this kind of thing for interpreting literature, yeah. for understanding and appreciating art history. But, but yeah. then, you, then you build apps that get people talking. And yes, you, you well, that's, that, that's that. what I was going to say. Instead of the app being the reactor to the thing, again, what you would say then is I'm teaching art history, and so what do I do in the real world? Yeah. Can I come up with a way to make it a little easier with this gadget to just do what I normally do? And by the well, way, don't outsource that to some company. Let me, the teacher, figure out how that right, software should right. work. And, and those kind of human skills yeah. that, that George was talking about really are, are kind of not going to be done through a flashcard type app, but through a getting people talking, through discussion, through sure. yeah, conversation, it's, et cetera, as we've always done. the basis of Moodle, in fact, is, is about right. creating collaborative communities. Great. Thank you. Michael. Yeah. Um, so we've heard a lot in this panel about making machines smarter, you know, robot toilets that somehow connect to our printers <laughs> over the Wi-Fi network. <laughs> Until you change but the password. Until we reach that great moment of convergence where we have the magical robot toilets in the sky, I'm, I'm more interested in how openness can help me be smart enough to connect my printer over the Wi-Fi network. Um, so uh, I guess I want to I wanna ask a question based on, on a comment that Provost Cartwright made, uh, made about 
the classes where you tuned out where the professor's just talking at you and the classes where the, the professor is actually engaging you in, in some problem solving. And my experience is that students, almost like normal human beings, <laughs> like to be involved in things that matter. And so just as an example to start conversation, I, I'd like to throw out to the LMS wonks on the panel the example to react to of Chisimbo, the, the open source learning management system built by Africans for Africans, which isn't necessarily going to do, revolutionize the field of learning management systems. That was not the purpose of the project. And I wonder if you would all take a moment to reflect on the, the quality of openness as a process and how that affects learning. Okay, I'll answer. I'll start with your, your Simbo example. So one of my other sort of uh, thoughts is, is that there will be 500 learning management systems minimum in the future and that can be one of them. And with good open standards, and that's gonna, the whole thing is gonna be about open standards and interoperability. With good open standards, they can make their own LMS and have all 100,000 apps fit in their LMS as well, right? If you have a clean, open, official way between an LMS and an app, then you can go ahead, you can write every app. It, you learn a lot when you write an LMS. Go ahead, write an LMS, it's, it, it can't hurt you. You're gonna get your five things right, it's gonna be fine. Maybe you only have smaller schools or something and you write it in Perl and that, who cares, it's fine. But you know what, with a little nice standard for interoperability, you can put every learning app on the planet and if you can take back the data, you can even do your own data analysis. And so the key thing is innovate on both, when you have a standard, you can innovate on both sides independently and that doesn't mean that there's like four big LMSs and then the app stores. There's 40 or 400 or 4,000 LMSs and 100,000 apps in the app store and it just doesn't matter. And frankly, that's the thing about the router in your toilet, <laughs> right? That's how we solve the router toilet problem. And that is, if you have a router, if you have a, you know, a toilet from Samsung, not that I'm, I'm not mean at Samsung, but let's just say you have a Samsung router and a Samsung toilet and they somehow can find each other and then you change the password and the Samsung thing can't do it. Or if you have some, other router that's got a web server on the toilet, I mean on the router, and a web server on the toilet, and you can look at its internal state, right? You might have to bring your nephew in to look at them, but at least <laughs> your nephew can figure out why your router's not talking to your toilet. But if there's just magic, black box, black box, no interoperability, because the interoperability there is there's HTTP in both your router and your toilet, right? So interoperable standards means that it's okay. You don't have to say, oh, I got these magic four LMSs, and that's the only way. Because Pearson would be happy to give you the one LMS and here's an app store. And as a matter of fact, there are folks that are doing that, like Edmodo is a good example of an LMS that has an app store. whoop de doo there's no standard involved in it. That app, the apps in Edmodo can't run in any other LMS. Vice versa, it just doesn't matter. You can't put LTI into Edmodo, you can't put whatever. So it comes down to interoperability and standards, which are the kind of the fabric of it all. So we're about out of time. I want to take one more question so that we will have time to visit the connected toilet before the next session begins. <laughs> so go ahead. This is sort of I'm, throwback. I'm sorry, to... I just wanted to say that oh, a student graduated with a PhD from RIT two days ago. Connected toilet, baby. Oh. <laughs> of course, oh, it's the future. I'd like to go back to uh, the use of um, the learning technology. And the question is directed to, to Martin. Martin, uh, can you sort of tell us what decisions you made that led to the success of Moodle? I notice that Moodle is number one in terms of use worldwide in most majors. And perhaps for the audience and for me, perhaps you could give us the latest statistics on your use? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, well, uh, so the thing is about being very open is you don't have very good statistics. Hmm. Uh, so we ask people to register, and uh, we have something like 80,000 registered sites using Moodle. However, any room I go into and I ask people, have you registered, it turns out less than 10% have, so it's much higher than that. Um, but numbers isn't really what we set out to do, what I set out to do, um, and you talked about what made it spread, and, and for me, I was reading about complexity theory at the time when I started Moodle, remember complexity theory? So, you know, you can have a table like this and drop sand grains onto it from high up, and it will form a beautiful pyramid, 
right? A, a nice geometric shape from randomness. And uh, there's a lot of other examples of how complexity works, but for me, it was you have to create initial conditions. So I think about what are motivations for people downloading, installing, uh, contributing to, uh, rewriting, commenting on, and it's about making those as easy as possible um, and uh, creating those initial conditions. And then human beings, being what they are, lovely, beautiful human beings, with uh, almost always good intentions, will just join the party. Um, and I guess that's probably build it and they will come. But um, it, it, it's been always the case that we tried to make Moodle trustworthy so you can trust it. Because once you trust it, you want to put well, your own work into it. You want to contribute to it. And, uh, and so you know, if anyone has got an open project they're considering, I'd say that's probably their number one concern, is to make it a trustworthy thing um, with, with good intentions, good ideals, good follow through. Um, and then you know, it, it will no doubt succeed. Okay, Thanks. thank you to the panel and thank you everyone. Thank you.